Welcome to a visual history of Cheyenne Mountain School and the surrounding area of Colorado Springs. The video you are about to see is taken from film shot by Dr. Lloyd Shaw during the 1920s and 30s. About 400 students were enrolled in the entire kindergarten through 12th grade system. Approximately 90 students were enrolled in the high school, which was 9th through 12th. In this photo, a person many students will recognize is Mr. Frank Pop Evans, who taught mathematics and shop at Cheyenne for many years. He died in the early 1990s. In this next photo, another person that most students from that period will recognize is Dr. Lloyd Pappy Shaw. He was superintendent of District 12 from 1916 to 1951. During the time that Dr. Shaw was superintendent of District 12, both the kindergarten and the main building were located on premises of the present Cheyenne Mountain Junior High School. The school conducted numerous activities for students among them, snow skiing for those in high school. In this opening scene, students are skiing on Pike's Peak from 14 mile post near Devil's Playground to Glen Cove. During the early part of the 20th century, the ski lifts, T-bars, chair lifts that we are accustomed to now did not exist. And for many students on these skiing trips, the skiing was actually done in areas where there were no lifts. Students would ski to the bottom of the hill, pack up their skis on the back, climb to the top of the mountain, and come down again, so that by the end of the day, everyone was thoroughly exhausted. In this scene, we see students from Cheyenne at Crescent Ranch, which is located near Divide, Colorado. Today, that's a key place for moving on to Cripple Creek. The school also sponsored camping trips for both boys and girls, and in this scene we see boys skiing during a camping trip taken at Independence Pass on the Continental Divide leading over to Aspen. Some of the personalities in this scene are Dr. Shaw, Dolly Shaw, his daughter, Bill Wyman, and Shelley McMillan. The tradition of good tennis existed even in the 1920s and 30s at Cheyenne School. Here we see the tennis courts located at the east end of the school grounds near the present junior high. Two of the students we recognize playing tennis are Dorothy Kettle Bender and Betty Jean Baker. Another popular sport at Cheyenne Mountain High School was archery. Here students can be seen taking target practice at the east end of the playground. Many of the students made their own bows and arrows in Mr. Evans' shop class. One of the practices of Dr. Shaw was to have as many sports as possible in which all students could participate, both boys and girls. During this early period of the school in the 1920s and 30s, there was no football team, even though there was a football field, which we'll see later on. But by accentuating those sports in which both boys and girls could play, there was certainly an equality. Those students who enjoyed archery would often go on a game of roving at Coral Bluffs, now known as Austin Bluffs, on Farmers Highway east of Colorado Springs. From these scenes, we see ourselves way out on the plains of Colorado, but today we'd be near Academy Boulevard or Circle Drive in a well-populated area. The purpose of this game of roving was to hit a designated target on the horizon. The target would be chosen by a student, and it could be a yucca plant a sagebrush cluster, a cow chip, or whatever. Once that target was hit, 
Then the students selected the next object on the horizon and the game continued. Some of the students we can recognize in this scene are Roberta McKay, Dave Hall, Henry Meyer, Dolly Shaw, Fred Baker, Wanda Todd, Dick Nelson, and Bud Udick. This scene is of the west side of the school during a noontime activity with students playing baseball and other free-for-all activities during the lunch period. One of the recognizable parts of the school was the attractive wooden fence that surrounded the area. Two people that we have recognized here are Christine Cotton and Clark Casey. During this period of the 20s and 30s, the school also kept a three-hole golf course on the west half of the school grounds. Some of the golfers that we recognize are Bill Wyman, Lloyd Nelson, and Joe Kamiska. Although we see goal posts for a football field, the school had no team. This was in part due to the philosophy of Dr. Shaw and also to the small student body. Not shown in this scene was an underground kiva, which was located in the northwest corner of the school grounds. Kivas existed in southwestern Colorado, near Mesa Verde, and in northern New Mexico near Chaco Canyon with the Anasazi Indians in the period of 900 to 1200. The kiva that existed on the grounds of the Cheyenne School was there until the early 1940s. The tradition of the kiva, however, continues to this day. In the early years, it was a time to recognize the academic achievement of students. At this time, it's now a tribute by the junior class to the departing seniors. This scene was shot from the top of Cheyenne Mountain School. On the right is Cheyenne Boulevard, panning up over Cresta Vista towards Mount Cutler. Of course, we recognize that at that time, there was no housing in that area. One of the popular sports at the school was track and field. In this particular meet, Manitou was the opposing team. During that time, in the 1920s and 30s, the pits were filled not with foam rubber, but with sawdust. Also, the fans were able to stand within two feet of the runners and the players. Another interesting aspect of track and field was that the track was covered with cinders. An interesting aspect of Cheyenne Mountain School during this period from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s was that the population of the school remained relatively stable. From kindergarten through 12th grade was housed in the main school and in the small kindergarten school that we see in the background, the adobe style. At this time, the community of Colorado Springs had a population of between 25 and 30,000. And there was no addition or building at Cheyenne School until the late 40s. Part of this came about because of the Second World War, when many people, particularly men, had were assigned to Camp Carson, and after the war, returned to Colorado Springs to live. And it was at that time that the population began to expand, and Cheyenne School then began to grow and make additions. One of the unplanned benefits of attending Cheyenne Mountain School during this period was that by the time a student reached 12th grade, he or she knew a generation of students 12 years ahead and 12 years behind. In this scene, basketball awards are being presented by Coach Nelson. The players are Jerry Bright, Chuck Smith, 
Leonard Vandenberg, Chuck Vandenberg, Bob Hansen, Marion Neese, Soapy Washner, Shelley McMillan, Harley Nips, and Lloyd Nelson. Another popular club at Cheyenne School was the $5 Ford Club. This club was so named because students, theoretically, were to restrict the cost of preparing cars to $5 each. More than this amount was sometimes spent, and not all the strip downs were Model T Fords. In this section, you'll see students driving in Sweet Potato Gulch or Rat Alley in North Cheyenne Canyon and later you'll see them challenging the clay banks at 19th and Manitou Boulevard. Some of the people we recognize in this section are Otis Elliott, Bud Udick, Fred Baker, and Jerry Bright. So enjoy their driving and enjoy the music. Another interesting aspect of life at Cheyenne School was the Glider Club. This glider was purchased from Alexander Aircraft in Colorado Springs. The glider shed was on school grounds and was constructed by Mr. Hinch under the supervision of Frank Evans, who was the shop teacher. This shed was on the west side of the school grounds. The glider was put together and then loaded onto a truck. From the school, it was taken across the school grounds, onto a road, and then up to Cresta Vista where the present Shine Mountain High School exists. The instructor was Mr. Dwight Spencer. The glider club only existed for one year, and that was 1931. Once up on Cresta Vista, 
where there were no roads, no Crestor Road, and no 21st Street, it was often taken to a height of 150 feet. The glider had been constructed by Alexander Aircraft in Colorado Springs. Alexander's had originally started in Denver and later moved to Colorado Springs in 1927. Alexander's had developed the famous Eagle Rock, which was the name of one of the planes they built. Another interesting aspect in relation to Alexander's is that Charles Lindbergh had wanted to fly the Atlantic in an Alexander plane, but the company could not build it in time for him. To commemorate this glider, a special stamp was made by Cheyenne School honoring the first flight. After one year, the glider was sold to a man who attempted to fly it off of Pike's Peak with disastrous results. In this scene, we see students cutting lodgepole pines, some from as far away as Taylor Park. This was done by the students working after school hours and on Saturdays and Sundays. And the purpose of this was to construct corrals for a rodeo that the school sponsored. In this particular scene, we see students constructing the corrals for a rodeo that was held in October of 1933 on top of Cresta Hill near the present high school. The rodeo stock for this event was rented from Mr. Gaylor in Green Mountain Falls. And the school even hired a champion cowboy from Terriol to act as an advisor. Rodeo was an important aspect of life for Dr. Shaw. He distinguished himself in an educator's conference one time by advocating the rodeo as a safer sport than football, and he proceeded to conduct a genuine rodeo, Brahma bulls and all. And the only casualty was to himself, for he broke three ribs trying to bulldog a steer. He mastered the double loop rope spin, and refused to wear any hat but a broad-brimmed Stetson. He memorized the shooting of Dan McGrew to the last bitter syllable and gladly proclaimed it for any willing listener. He pastured several dozen horses on the school mesa and refused to ride in a car unless it was absolutely necessary. Some of the personalities in this scene are Chuck McGuire, Eleanor Pick, and Evelyn Pick. Cheyenne School also sponsored a riding club. And here we see people horseback riding in North Cheyenne Canyon and on Cutler Trail. According to William Conti in his book, The Cheyenne Mountain Story, 
The various mining operations on Cheyenne Mountain led to the development of a network of trails and wagon roads crisscrossing the eastern slope of the mountain. These primitive pathways were made more definite and enlarged as residents traversed them in their annual wood gathering expeditions. Certain trails endured and were improved upon. One such road was to become known as the old Cripple Creek Stage Road. At the time of its origin, it was anticipated the stage road would carry travelers to new mountain resorts, which the tourist trade demanded. Later, it was to complete the route to Cripple Creek and carry passengers and gold between Colorado Springs and the mining district. People we recognize in this scene are Dolly Shaw, Hildegard Neal, Edith Kearney, Fred Baker, and Mrs. Neal. In this scene, we see a nature study excursion being taken by Miss Ethel Bodding's second grade class. The students board the school bus and go to Sweet Potato Gulch in North Cheyenne Canyon. Not only was nature studied in the classroom and on the school grounds, but there were numerous excursions into the area. There were camping trips for high school students, trips to Pat's Pile, and even beginning in kindergarten and first grade, students had to learn about the area in which they lived. Deer frequently roamed this area in the 1930s and were seen on the school grounds also. People that we recognize in this scene include Miss Bodding, Millie Cook, Bob Cook, Harry Huss, and Dorothy Vandenberg. An important part of life at Cheyenne School was the Nature Preserve. The preserve was located across Cheyenne Road, south of the main school building, on the premises of present Canyon Elementary School. Here we see Miss Knowles taking her first grade students on a hike through the preserve. The preserve contained many footbridges and paths, a small Greek amphitheater, and a variety of flowers, shrubs, and trees. Cheyenne Creek flowed along the edge of the preserve. The teepee being erected was the center of attraction at the Friday night campfire parties. The teepee was also taken along on weekend camping trips that the school sponsored. The nature preserve was an important part of Dr. Shaw's philosophy and was rooted in his own background. 
He had worked during the summers as a youngster as a guide on the cog train up Pikes Peak. He pointed out rocks that resembled Andy Gump, identifying alpine flowers and reviving sightseers from low altitudes. It was on this job that he developed a voice which could easily pierce the rumble of iron wheels and an endless fund of chatter and anecdote and a love for the mountains which he soon turned to good account. His restlessness at last drove him into the mountains to spend a summer completely alone, lying under the open sky at night, scaling the granite crags by day, crossing great seas of volcanic rock, daring the winds and rains and snows above Colorado's timberline. He lived among mountain sheep, made confidants of chipmunks and shy grosbeaks, and found a sort of peace in the loneliness of windswept slopes and rushing icy brooks. When he came home, he wrote a children's book of nature study, a fairy tale full of the lore of the forest. Fat midget squirrels, yellow bobolinks, the first anemones, and the smell of pine needles in the sun are captured between the covers. And this product of strangely mingled artistry and discontent is loved and not forgotten by Western youngsters. These thoughts about Dr. Shaw and his appreciation of nature were written by Miss Jane Carruthers, a graduate of Cheyenne Mountain School. The article she wrote was published in the Wellesley Review. All the bridge and pathwork in the nature preserve was constructed by students and faculty under the supervision of Mr. Evans. The nature preserve was appreciated and used not only by students at the school, but by the entire community. Some of the people that we have been able to recognize in this scene are Soapy Washner, Dorothy Vandenberg, Buddy Huss, Dale Owens, Bob Irwin, and Fred Baker. The care of the preserve was done by the students, feeding the birds, putting out food for animals, and in the whole process, appreciating the nature and beauty of the area in which they lived. In the background, we see the Cheyenne Mountain School Kindergarten. The kindergarten building was located near Cheyenne Road on the south side of the school grounds. Its interesting architectural design with a southwestern motif is remembered by all students who attended the school. Originally, this building was Sanford's lunchroom prior to its purchase by the school board. The building had a sod-roofed porch and during the Christmas season, the beauty of the building was enhanced by luminaries which were placed around the edges and kept lit by students. In the early 1950s, after the kindergarten moved to the new Canyon Elementary School, the building served as a student lounge for the high school. An interesting sidelight to the kindergarten was that when the school board purchased the Sanford building, Cheyenne Road was rerouted, resulting in the kindergarten being on the north side of the road instead of the south. In keeping with the tradition and philosophy of the school, even in kindergarten, the students were used to going to the nature preserve, picking flowers, learning the trees and the animals and the style of the area in which they lived. And for those students who attended the kindergarten, it was not an ordinary building, but was very special. Here we see the teacher, Aline Anderson Phelps, working with her students, playing games, introducing them to the studies and to the world in which they would soon be living. Two of the students we recognize are Roberta Barney and Chuck Floyd.
The next scenes are of nature study in the classroom. The classes that we recognize are Miss Davies' third grade class, Mrs. Dodd's fourth grade class, and Miss Locke's fifth grade class. In addition to these teachers, we also recognize Bill Lamberson, Lindsay Feldman, and Betty Wilcox. Drama was an important aspect of life at Cheyenne School. The main gift to the community in Dr. Shaw's mind was The Littlest Wise Man, which was performed in the school theater. But in addition, other plays were performed in the nature preserve. Here we see Miss Knowles' first graders performing Harvest Moon. Other classes performed seasonal plays also. The nature preserve had its own stage and amphitheater. This is the crowning of the Queen of the May, annually held in the Nature Preserve. As we draw to the end of this video, we see the old school and playground equipment the barrel of fun, the jungle maze, and the open slide. Also located on the southeast section of the school grounds were numerous trees and rocks, which were part of the landscaping. Undoubtedly, some of the apparatus shown in the film would be considered too dangerous for today's playgrounds. However, it was part of Dr. Shaw's philosophy that a certain amount of danger was essential to the full development of character in the individual. I hope you have enjoyed this look back at the scenery, surroundings, and activity at Cheyenne Mountain School in the 1920s and 30s. We leave you with pictures of the good times and the school song.